forward and let's let's live on Facebook. How's this gonna go? Let's see. All right. Are we ready? Nope. One second. I will <laughs> introduce you in a second. Let's see. Here goes to your Facebook page. It's the first. Welcome, everyone. My name is Steve Stein, and I'm the host. I'm the founder of Better Listen. Been publishing audiobooks for many years with Marion Woodman, Robert Bly, uh, James Hillman, and most recently uh, with Eva Ryder. And uh, recently, we have Wisdom Feed Plus is our new platform. It's a new membership and taking ancient ideas down to street level, which is apropos for today's session. So today's session, we're, uh, we're very pleased and proud to have uh, Eva Ryder do uh, kind of a background and context for a new program. We're very, very happy to help uh, her distribute and publish Sophia Sparks, A Return of Light and Matter at Alchemical Pathways to Individuation Through the tree of life. And then also, why is it relevant today? Welcome, Eva. Thank you, Steve. And thank you so much for hosting this. Um, can I, uh, this button that says got it, can that go away? Okay. Just click okay. got it and it'll go okay. away. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hello. Hello, everyone, friends. Um, some of you I know very well. <laughs> Hello. And um, some of you I'm meeting for the first time. So um, I'm going to begin. So a little bit of background on how Sophia Sparks came together. I first taught, I've been uh, studying uh, Kabbalah, astrology, um, alchemy, and tarot for over 40 years. And it's been on, and I'm, all, all, of course, also a student of Marion Woodman's and um, went through the body soul training and the whole thing has kind of merged together and I had the opportunity in 2020 at uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute to bring the program to the continuing legacy of Marion Woodman and two weeks later uh, some of you know we went into lockdown uh, for the COVID coronavirus and um, some of the students wanted to continue uh, with this work. And so we began a program called A Fool's Odyssey, where we climbed the tree through the major arcana of the tarot as pathways. Um, that went on for about nine or 10 weeks. And then when we got the top, to the top, we realized we were at the Sophia point, the point of the feminine wanting. She was just present. Sophia wants to return. Sophia, of course, is the uh, name of the goddess of wisdom in Greek. And we'll get more into that. And so Sophia Sparks became an 11 part journey going through each of the Sephirot or otherwise the sphere on the tree of life, uh, going through um, alchemy, uh, astrology as pathways to bring spirit return to matter since we had gone up. And the two programs can subsist separately. The Fool's Odyssey we did before that, but the Mystic Fool is up on my website at Reclaiming Soul. It's been up there. Um, that's the one we did on the depth psychology. But they do stand alone, um, and they're yet companions. So that's the beginning. So I'm going to begin, if I may, um, uh, I'm going to very quickly share screen with you and go through a little bit of the background, and then I'm going to open it up to uh, questions. I also have a couple of short videos that I would like to share that will give you a little more, um, again, a little more information. So I'm going to share screen. Um, and in fact... So just to put Sophia Sparks up here, and I'm going to read you this. Um, and this is uh, by Marion Woodman, Leaving My Father's House. And she writes, the eternal feminine is thrusting her way into com contemporary consciousness. I know how difficult it is to uphold Sophia's values in a world that has no time for her. 
I know how many people are alone, suffering radical upheavals in their dreams without any support. Sophia, Shakina, Kuan Yin, whatever her name, she is the manifestation of the divine in matter. Among her many faces are the Black Madonna, White Buffalo Woman, Shakti, Kali, Aphrodite. Hers are the ways of peace, compassion, reverence for life and death in the oneness of nature. It is our immediate task to relate to the feminine, whether she comes to us in dreams, in the loss of those we love, in body disease or in ecological distress. Conscious femininity is not bound to gender. It belongs to both men and women. Each of us in our own way is being brought face to face with her challenge. For too long, we have taken the instinctual mother goddess for granted. In our bodies, in our earth, we have assumed she would nourish and protect us. We have forgotten her, reviled her, raped her. Now we will either integrate her laws into consciousness or we will die. That was Marion Woodman leaving my father's house, 1992. So I'm going to go through a few of these a little bit to give you some background, and then we will open it up. So um, this are, these are excerpts um, from the class itself, from class one of the 11. So let it be known, the eternal feminine in an incorruptible body is descending to earth. In the unfading light of the new goddess, heaven has become one with the deeps. Vladimir Soloviev and the Sophia as the feminine face of God, the mother of the world, also known the Sophia Anima Mundi by Nicholas Rorick. And the feminine mind is pictorial and symbolic and comes close to what the ancients called Sophia from Jung. So here is the tree of life. And just as a background, what we're going to be doing, if you can see my cursor, the Sophia Sparks program begins up here in the first spark, um, otherwise known as the Yod. It's Keter, the crown. Now, it was very interesting in doing going through this class during coronavirus, which means the crown, that the crown opened up and this new energy came through, in many cases, very disruptive, but almost as an evolutionary virus, it began to come through our world and transformed us forever. So while we were doing, we were in as a class, there were about 25 of us in the Sophia Sparks class, we were experiencing this energy coming through. And we came through what is called the lightning path, um, leaving this realm. This is the realm of the, uh, the archetypal uh, realm from which um, that's why it is not a color. Um, it is beyond time and space. And then we descended through what is called Doth or the abyss and came, this is Sophia in matter as lead and burst into color and we come into time and space as we come closer to matter. Here is the abyss, uh, then the sun, the moon, and at last we arrive in earth, bringing the energy in to earth. These are all aligned with the alchemical processes, which in Jung in his later works um, outlined basically um, how alchemy is the psychological process towards individuation. And so this is a map. I'm really grateful and blessed to have this map and um, to share it with you. Um, because it is a map that allows us to see the pathways that take us towards individuation and be able to sometimes know that when we're stuck in Negredo, the darkness, we're here. Or when we're stuck in tears, we may be here. Um, and then to arrive at a sacred marriage. And then again, to break apart and have to separate here, you know, and come together again in beauty here. So on, so the whole program is about pathways and linking back to Jung's psych alchemical psychology. So I'm going to just go forward a little bit. Um, and with Marion, unfortunately, the this particular thing is has not been, this movie isn't available at the moment, but here's an excerpt. 
I do believe that we all have a destiny. We either live it or we escape because we're afraid to live our own reality. I feel blessed. I didn't really have choices. I have been forced through dreams, through my body responses, through illness to surrender. The surrender feels like death. But if you're going to live your full soul's journey and find the spiritual dimension, you're going to go this way and surrender the old life to the new. I do not see surrender as failure at all. I would have simply died if I hadn't seen that in the death was the birth of a whole new consciousness. Everybody is gone. Total silence where once the sweet birds sang. I hear them off, very off, way, way down the hall. Madam shouts, they're both ready and rolling. What exactly I'm supposed to do when they get here, I do not know. Oh, I'm describing you people doing all of this. You filming? Pardon? You making a film on you? Making a film on me, yes, I'm writing, but I don't know your name again. I've forgotten. Sanjay. Sanjay. S A N J A Y. Is that Indian? It's an Indian name. Indian. This is Marion Woodman. Before I attended one of her workshops, I knew very little about Marion, but like thousands of others around the world, I quickly fell under her spell and found myself making this film about her life. So I'm going to stop that because it, it turns out I have the entire film here. So um, I was hoping to just share an excerpt with you. It's wonderful because this film is not available right now. <laughs> so you got, so there is an excerpt. So I am going to just very uh, quickly move forward um, and uh, share with you this thing that is an excerpt specifically on um, Sophia. Um, and this is with Alice Howell um, from years ago. Let me begin by asking you, what is the meaning behind the title of your book, The Dove and the Stone? Well, I agree. It's a bit of a, a difficult concept just to read The Dove and the Stone. But the subtitle says, Finding the Sacred in the Commonplace. And for me, when I discovered that um, Jung had pointed out that the dove was the only symbol left to in the Trinity for the Holy Ghost or the Holy, you know, the Holy Spirit. Uh, somehow that clued me into doing further research. And Jung pointed out that the Christian Trinity originally was God the Father, God the Son, and Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia meaning uh, holy wisdom, and that this was feminine, and that the only clue to the fact that the third person of the Trinity is feminine was the dove, because the dove was a, um, a symbol of Astarte and the, the ancient goddesses. And he also pointed out that when the term Hagia Sophia, which is Greek, when that was translated into uh, Latin, it became Spiritus Sanctus. Now, what gender are the words in Latin, Spiritus Sanctus? Masculine. Yeah, so if you refer in a, with a pronoun to Spiritus Sanctus, you'd have to use a masculine one. 
And so gradually the whole Trinity or the Godhead in early Christian times uh, became masculine. And this did a, a very sad thing to really literally, not only to women, but also to our attitude towards nature. And somehow the idea that nature is sacred and our, that our daily life, as it were, could also be the hiding place of uh, the sacred, kind of vanished. Everything got projected out into heaven or out there somewhere. And as a result, both women and nature and ecology have suffered until I would say the last 50 years where we're beginning to, to change our view. Well, now the dove in the stone, the stone part, is the idea that the stone, which is matter, might not be just matter. And I think that uh, nuclear physics uh, is coming to our rescue, because if you come right down to what, what is matter, it's atoms. And what is in atoms is nuclei and protons and electron and energy. And what is so exciting with that idea is that energy is everywhere. It's just matter is energy at a slower rate. So if that energy is divine, then everything is holy. Where does the Virgin Mary fit in in our Western tradition as a symbol of the feminine? The Virgin Mary had to... to she caught the projection, as it were, of the feminine and of the goddess. And she has been a most powerful symbol for the past 2,000 years uh, for women. But the limitations of the Virgin Mary, I'm speaking now not to offend anybody, you know, because I too will honor the Virgin Mary deeply. The Virgin Mary was not described as having an IQ of any kind. And I think that this too kept women in their place, that the idea of women being able to think or to uh, express their thoughts uh, was certainly not encouraged. And about recently, let's say as the 16th century, a woman in England was put to death because she had a copy of the Psalms in her apron pocket. But I think we are now evolving that women today uh, need to get past the idea that being innocent and pure and sweet is all. That, that women too have, have a right to be whole beings. And Jung pointed out that when let's say the feminine was pushed out of the, the Godhead, uh, so was the devil or Lucifer, whatever. And so in the Middle Ages, you get these two coming together in a way that in a negative sense, the feminine and the devilish consorting together, that was, that was the worst that could possibly happen. And so if I'm right in suspecting that Hagia Sophia is the the feminine to come for all of us, it would it would involve a kind of feminine wisdom open both to men and to to women that isn't so um, heavy. But the figure of wisdom in the Old Testament is young kind, loving to human beings. So you feel like a lot of other writers now that there is a reemergence of the feminine principle mm -hmm. and how, where do you see that taking place? Well, if, if, if it's right, according to the prophecy of um, a medieval monk whose name was Joachim of Flores, uh, he, he said that he felt that uh, God the Father was the God of the Old Testament, and God the Son was, um, uh, let's say, the, the archetype of the New Testament. But that the quote-unquote New Age 
uh, the age to come, as he said, would be the age of the Holy Spirit. And so we're back again to Hagia Sophia. And uh, one of the synchronicities that I mentioned. So there you go. Um, I'm going to stop screen. Um, but that's an excerpt from um, uh, the late, late great Alice A. Howell, astrologer and Jungian analyst. And that really is succinct as to <clears throat> giving us a background about Sophia. So let's open it up to questions. We can always go back to images anytime. <laughs> There's lots of them. Just a quick little note. I am putting in the uh, in the chat a link to the program that uh, we're we're making the complete. How many hours is it? Seventeen or eighteen hours? Yes, it's eighteen hours. And so the complete program is somewhat discounted now for for the amount of beautiful uh, imagery and knowledge that's there. And in addition to that. We're also uh, offering uh, an audio that we did with uh, Robert Bly and Marion Woodman on the Maiden King uh, a number of years back. That's you know very well received. So anyone who orders in the next, uh, I think till Monday night, uh, they'll get the bonus uh, uh, Woodman, uh, Marion Woodman and Robert Bly audio. And uh, so that's it. So. Are we going to take questions now? Is that what you were saying? Yes, please. Yes, I'd love to open it up to questions if there are any that always. Feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand either way. Or type it in, type it in the chat. Um, I have a question. Hi. Yes. Hello. Um, I could put my video on. I'm just, I'm in the kitchen doing a little bit of food prep, but um, did Marion, hello, how are you? Um, did Marion pull mm -hmm. on Alice's work for her own? Yeah. I, I haven't heard of Alice <clears throat> before, actually. Yeah, yes, I stumbled on it in my research. Um, no, because Marion wasn't an astrologer. Alice Howell was an astrologer, and I suspect they may have known each other, but no, she did not. Um, but it just just fits so beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Really yeah. does. So Dancing with the Flames is not available anymore. Apparently, it is not available. I clearly, I downloaded it. I, I own a copy, of course, and um, I think it will have to be available again. I I have, rec I've, I've had word from the Marion Woodman Foundation they're looking for where it is. It's not anywhere to be found at the moment. It's not even for sale. So, um, but it may be possible to write to Adam Reed at Capri Films and ask him when it's going to be available. Um, I was surprised. I was going to play a little excerpt for you. And as you can see, I realized I had the whole thing here, 80 right. minutes. So uh, it's there. And I don't know if I have permission to show it, but I'll find out. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Denise. Of course. Lovely to see you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Patrice. Yes. Um. Uh, uh, someone was saying that uh, they had difficulty getting the book "Dancing in the Flames." I think I recently ordered it, so it it is on its way here. And the other one is um, "Leaving My Father's House." which is um, actually a metaphor for um, not her actual father, but the, the patriarchal system that she leaves behind, the masculine system. And um, I was previously told that these books are not um, available, but now I recently ordered them, so they are um, there, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I have a, a wonderful question to ask is this um, this Sophia Sparks does it have some sort of correlation with Jung's um, feminine principle Eros yes yeah um, 
In fact, um, the, um, I mean, I could share screen. It incorporates all of it, the entire alchemical, uh, alchemical processes. And so Eris and Logos, um, it goes through, there are correspondences. I, I can go back and share screen in a few minutes and show you how some of the correspondences appear. And just also in response to Dancing in the Flames, the book is not the same as the movie. They're, they have the same name, but they're not connected. The book, Dancing in the Flames, was co-written by Eleanor Dixon, and uh, who is very much with us, and, and Marion together. And so marvelous book. And they did write a second one, but it is not related to this film. So just to clarify that. Yes. Thank you for the question. I will go back and go into the tree a little bit more, um, just so you get a sense, because it's a map. It's a map of psyche, of cosmos, psyche, and matter, that are the pleroma and cosmos and chaos. Um, it's a map that allows us to see, um, uh, Gian Fortune called it a filing system for the whole cosmos, for the whole universe. And um, it's, it's just been so helpful to me over the course of my life. And it's just time to share it. And yes, yeah, thank you for that question, Joya. Patrice, you had a question. You could unmute yourself or I can. I do have a question. Thank you, Eva and Steve, for making this session available. Um, I was wondering, Eva, if you could say a little bit more about sort of like the concrete nature of the work on these alchemical pathways, and, you know, using the tools of the, the Tarot and astrology and the depth psychology. What, what is the process or the processes? Can you say a little bit more about concretely by which you navigate those pathways in this 11 part yes. series? <clears throat> so at this point, I would like to share screen because it's much easier to see it in image. So um, I'm going to just share screen and show you um go back to um the tree itself so let's go to this one as you can see i've got all of it here so um all right so this is an image of the tree and uh itself and so i'm going to give you some of the correspondences you can get a sense so there are four trees called jacob's ladder where we go through uh i won't go into them right now um but they go from um earth sensation um corresponding uh earth sensation corresponds to jung uh and then um to thinking which would be um air uh, water um, as we go higher of the tree and that would be of course feeling and then the highest level um, I mean Jung was clearly using these systems the highest level is fire uh, which is um, uh, intuition but um, the, for our purposes we're using the bottom levels of the tree so we can access them on a more human level and so this I correspondence I connected it to the planet Neptune because Neptune is like the womb state, according to uh, Stanislav Grof's system, and it's the beginning, the first light, it's the spark of light that then moves down into what I see as Uranus, which of course rules Aquarius, and is the force, the energy of force, and is called uh, wisdom, and then across to the feminine here, which is understanding. But these are all one, and this is what Alice Howell was just talking about, the Trinity, and that the Sophia is the feminine face of God, as Marion spoke about her. But she's also the Shekinah. She's also Isis. She's also um, Shikta, Shakti, and Shiva. So we're seeing this upper realm. And then as we move, this, of course, is already familiar to the ancients. It's Saturn. It corresponds to lead. So we're seeing the beginning of the alchemical processes here. And then we move down. We move through the abyss which is the place we go through all transformations. When we are born, when we die, we fall from this perfect place on the tree of life um, into matter. And as we fall, everything becomes color. And so here we are in the realm of Jupiter, which in alchemy is connected to the Seleucio. Um, across the Separatio, which is connected is Mars and Jupiter. 
And then we come down to uh, the first uh, Kuniokjios, the sun, the gold, and our path takes us lower. Um, here we go. We have Venus, which is copper, um, Mercury, which has to do with Quicksilver, and then the moon, which is considered the foundation of the entire tree, which is the distillation process before we land into coagulation, which is matter. So the whole process is we start with unconscious matter, which is the prima materia, and we descend. And our purpose is to bring consciousness into the world, to return wisdom and light back into matter. This is matter. And interestingly enough, in the tarot, in the major arcana, the uh, Bina, because astrology um, and alchemy um, and uh, tarot and magic, as is said, comes from Hermes Trismegistus, and this is the hermetic uh, tree that we're working with here. So this is relegated to Saturn, um, which is often thought of as the Greek, in the Greeks thought, uh, were very patriarchal, of course, and so it was the father, but if you, who um, basically ate his children, but if you strip that veil away from that father, what you have is the divine feminine, because she is the creator and destroyer of form, and so as Saturn, we, she is her intention it's incredible, is to return. And the card for the universe, which is the last card in the major arcana and the tarot, sits right over here between Yesod, the moon, the foundation, and earth, where you see the quaternity, air, fire, earth, and water manifest. So what you're seeing is the as of above, so below. So I'm going to leave this here for a moment. Um, are there any questions about this? Because this is the tool. This is the map. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I have uh, kind of a broad question. So is that uh, part of the whole concept of bringing the divine down to earth? Yes. 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 The divine is bringing, be, if this was the blackness that, you know, of the, the great goddess of the, the feminine or, or matter. I mean, she is like the intimation of matter. She's, she's, um, uh, the archetype of, of matter up here. This is just your way even beyond the archetypal realm. And then you're descending downwards um, in this pattern. Like it goes like this in the lightning. Um, in A Fool's Odyssey, we went up the tree using the serpent path like this going because the, the pathways um, correspond to the major arcana, the 22 cards, of the tarot and also of course the 22 letters of the hebrew alphabet and it's a lot of correspondences in alchemy maria asked uh did i hear you say four trees equated with jacob's ladder if so can you clarify thank you uh yes i mean it, i mean each tree contains trees within it but um jacob's ladder um was um, as I said, be, you know, uh, beginning with um, Earth, the earthly realm, which is called uh, Asiya, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, the, the next one up above it, like it's connected, um, would be um, um, the uh, Yetzira, which is air, and then Bria, which is water, and then finally you get to the Atsilu, which is um, um, I hope I have this. Yes, the absolute, which is fire, which is where the first spark comes from. But that's much more complicated than we need to deal with at this point, because we're basically dealing with the bottom trees. So we can also in our class, for those of you who are in the class, there's a couple of you, we would back into the tree as an exercise. And that's part of the program is backing into the tree, and then it becomes subjective. And it's the chakra system, you can itself with two sides, of course, because this side is the feminine side, the pillar of severity. This is the pillar of mercy, the masculine, but they're always, and this is the key, why we need both. They're always dancing together through the symbol of the caduceus. The masculine and the feminine are coming together into the sacred marriage. 
uh, through the quintessence. Um, and I don't want to use a, you know, language that, uh, you know, feel free to ask me anything, mm -hmm. but that sim symbol of the, Merc of the caduceus is the dance of the masculine and feminine. And as Marion used to say, you know, there are two snakes, the masculine goes, and then the feminine goes, and then they meet at the top, they're crowned, crowned in Keter, um, the crown, um, and they kiss at the top. <laughs> so, so I have a, a two-part question. So kind of what we do with Better Listen and Wisdom Feed is we try to take ancient ideas down to street level. So the first part of the question is, how is this relevant to life, to day-to-day -to -day life, to human beings? You know, I'm sure it is, but I don't know, you know, how, how would you, you know, kind of Thank quantify you. that? Thank you so much, Steve. That's a very excellent question. So basically, you're able to map our alchemical processes that Jung Jung's big discovery was ultimately that alchemy is the answer. And I have a little video I can share with you about that. Why? Because these processes over here, you have the negredo, which is the dark night of the soul, which the whole planet has been going in through collectively. Many of us have been experiencing it personally. Certainly this when the crown opened the coronavirus, um, it was like a virus that completely um, catapulted out of us, or all of us, the entire planet out of our old reality and moved us into a different reality. We are now in the Aquarian age in the sense that everything's on the airwaves. Aquarius rules the airwaves. We are now all of us sitting here together in the airwaves from all over the world. So that's the change. But the negredo is that dark breakdown it's the prima materia the old matter that's outlived its form which we're seeing um break down in our culture um and the next phase which we're going to go over here which is jupiter which is a dissolution it's related to tin it dissolves everything and you get melancholia you get sad you get you you're um you know it's a it's a dissolving of the old then the next phase you have here, you have Mars, which is a separation. It's a breaking apart. And the separation is necessary because we then have the ability to reflect, um, to stand back and say, okay, this is me and this is not me. This is where I'm projecting. I am separating um, in order to be able to uh, bring back together again. And then in the conjunction, which is there, and I'm not going to go into detail, there's more than one, we have the sacred marriage, we have the marriage of the king and the queen, the feminine, and the masculine, the dark and the light, the opposites over here come together and they meet in the center in perfect. Um, and this is, of course, beauty, um, Tiferet in Hebrew means beauty, and it's where the entire tree meets together. And this is the kind of the place where we individuate. You know, it's the mediation point between the light that we cannot lead, the sun behind the sun, and the sun itself, where we meet um, earth, you know, our earthly body, and our um, astral, our, the subtle body realm, and over here, the archetypal, and then that which is even beyond. So when we're going through these transformations, we're able to begin to go, okay, I'm in, I'm in Negredo right now. Or now I'm coming out of it, like the sun is starting to shine and I'm getting a better sense of it. Now, it's we go through this many times in our lives um, in di on different rungs of the ladder. It's a spiral journey. So if you were at the top of the tree looking down, it would be a spiral. If you were at the bottom, it, you know, on earth looking up, it's a spiral. So it's good to remember that once you know where you are, and you know, as I said, these are connected to planetary influences as well, then you can say, oh, I'm in this place, but it's going to change. I know it's going to change. There's an old story that when someone would come to Jung and they had a you know, really difficult time, um, Jung would say, let's break, break open a bottle of wine and celebrate because it's going to change. Similarly, if they came in and they said, ah, oh, Oh, I'm in such a great place. I'm, everything's great. He would say, I'm sorry to hear that. So, <laughs> so we're seeing this back and forth. And in that back and forth, there's the transcendent third. So here we see the tension of opposites and the transcendent third. 
taking place in our lives and we can map it through the astrology and through the alchemical processes. Does that answer your question? It, it, kind, it kind of does. So it's kind of like an alchemical or an archetypal kind of framework to look at not only the bigger picture, but the bigger, bigger picture. And like, okay, so where am I at in the process? You know, where am I at in relationship to my family and in, in relationship to my profession, in relationship to Corona? And that, the, the, uh, the correlation with Corona, I think, uh, you know, it's the first time I've heard you kind of uh, uh, mention that, you know, because I feel now that, you know, just in day-to-day -day life, I'm walking around without a mask and I'm going to events for the first time without a mask. So I feel like I don't know where I am on the tree, but I know it's different than it was six months ago kind of thing or a year ago. Thank God. Exactly. We're completely changed. And, and uh, exactly right. Thank you, Steve. And also... Um, when we back into the tree, we can experience it from the feminine. It reverses everything. We what do you mean back into it? What does that mean? I mean, we would literally imagine that we were, instead of looking at it objectively, we would imagine that we were backing in and that it what we were the tree. Like you uh -huh. are the tree. And then that's what I mean. And suddenly everything's on the opposite side. But that doesn't, you know, you're experiencing it at the chakra level, at the physical level. So you might know I'm going through an illness right now. You're going to be um, looking at, you know, where that is on the tree. I mean, this is this is a dark place. Um, um, so by backing into the tree, by becoming the tree, we are then getting in touch with the chakra system in the body as well. Uh that's helpful. So Pamela asks, so the 11 courses provide a sort of scaffolding for one's journey. Is that right? That's correct. That's exactly right. So what we did, um, we we the, the first class, I wanted to do an introduction. And that's the one that's up for free. I, I worked with Keter and I worked with Doth, which is not really, it's not really a sphere. I mean, um, it's actually behind the tree. It's the abyss but it is the pathway. It's not actually a sphere. So that there's actually only 10 spheres. So the first class I did this, and then the subsequent classes I went in order. I went through um, Hokma, um, which is the force, and then over here into the potential for form. These are potentialities, which is Bina, the great mother. And then we continued down um, experiencing um, through... Um, each of these, Jupiter, which is this experience of generosity and expansion, um, as opposed to the its opposite, which is Gavura, which is cutting away um, and separating and then coming together here and then refining further in Venus and, and Mercury and the moon as we move into what Marion called the subtle body. Now, in the subtle body, this is the psychoid realm, um, the subtle body um, is, you know, that place where, you know, even in the dream state, we, we experience that intersection, that overlap between our earthly bodies and the subtle body. So there's no, you know, the, it comes through in visions and in dreams and in art and uh, in poetry. So this is very important. Um, so so um, the whole kind of, uh, reason for this, uh, well, it's kind of an experiment. And so far I'm finding this experiment for this Zoom call to be kind of a success because I'm learning and people showed up. So there's obviously interest, but it's also to give context to the, pro the, the brilliant program, 18 hours of programming that, uh, that, that I put a link here. You'll also get a link in the email to be able to purchase. But you mentioned, and that was brilliant, Alice O'Hal. And I thought the name rang a bell. I've been doing these audios for many years. You know, I, drew, I recorded all the Robert Bly men's groups on the, in the middle of the country to the east, uh, to the east coast. And Marion Woodman, I worked with many years. Whenever she came in through New York at the at the Open Center, uh, James Hillman, we worked closely with uh, his. Uh, I was good friends with James, but just context, and it's, I'm scratching my head because 
I, I see that on October 30th, 1987, I recorded Alice O'Hall <laughs> on the topic was evolution of collect collective unconscious in astrology. So, Marvelous. So I hope you release that. I would love to hear that. Yeah, she's no longer with us. I'm not sure when she died, but um yeah. right. So that's something <laughs> I'd have to reach out to her found her foundation or something like that but i've got four thousand hours of recording so we release wow the, that's marvelous yes as uh, kind of they bubble up so maybe that's a reason to look into that one but that's all context to to say that it's been uh obviously eva uh, is an expert in this and it turns i kind of backed into not only the tree of life but into my life's work documenting and helping share the this info so um, any other questions? Uh, and then there's a couple more questions, but Eve, is there, and there's a bunch of people watching on the live stream on your Facebook page. So this recording will also be, if you have any friends that missed it, you can direct them to uh, Eva's Facebook page. And, uh, but anything else about the program or, you know, that comes to mind and then there's a couple of other questions but of course we're going to wind down in the next five or ten minutes or so so and then thanks everyone for showing up uh and uh, i had a hunch people would show up and be interested so i'm, I'm really glad uh we kind of did this uh, little test so eva anything else I, I, there's a question from uh yeah let's take some questions and then i can share a few more of the images and jung's little talk on alchemy which is very short so go ahead i'd love to hear the questions i'm going to keep this up because it helps to have the map because this is a map <laughs> reina asks i'm confused about jupiter being both expansion and known as the great benef benefit or benefice as well as yes. melancholia Oh, well, I, I made the connection to melancholia. It's only melancholia in the sense that it's not really melancholia. It's, it's Seleucio. It's the, it's the dissolving of the old matter um, in, in, into something new. And in alchemy, uh, medieval alchemy, the correspondence to Jupiter is um, Seleucio or dissolution, which is the next phase of the, uh, of the breakdown of the old the old way of seeing the old matter. Um, sometimes it can be on a physical health plane. So, um, but expansion, I mean, that's something to play with, certainly expansion. And it is benefit because we're flowing, we're beginning to flow. So from fire, um, which is this is related to fire, we're moving into water, into here, we're moving into in Gavura, we're moving into air, air. And then of course, um, we're moving um, towards the Cuneotio. Um, so this happens repeatedly on different levels, because as you can see, there are three triangles just on the tree. Um, but I hope that answers your question. It's actually an excellent one and would be worth delving into more. And, and Allison asks, does the program cover dream work? Um, the program, the people in the program brought their dreams. Um, the program itself does not delve into dream work, but um, I'm I'm a dream worker myself. I do a pretty extensive part of my practice. My therapeutic practice work is with dreams, and I use um, I use this system, of course, for everything. But the dream realm would be here. It would be imagination, thought, and then over here we have the realm of foundation, which is the moon. It's the lunar phase. So um, it can, it would be really fun to do a class on dreams in the tree. Um, so yes, yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And uh, yeah, uh, where, so where are some of these places? Virginia, UK, uh, Edinburgh, beautiful, Santa Fe, Toronto, Australia, uh, Colorado just great to see that there's interest from uh, yeah thank you it's great to, to have you all on um shall i move forward so i can show those of you who have yeah. not seen this. this is from the first class so it is available we did marion whoops we don't want to do that again 
So this is by Vanessa Folix, who's uh, one of our people. Um, she took that beautiful picture. And again, from Marion, the body has a wisdom of its own. However, slowly and circuitously, that wisdom manifests. Once it experiences, it is a foundation. A, that's that moon phase, a basis of knowing that gives confidence to the ego. To reach its wisdom requires absolute concentration dropping the mind into the body, breathing into whatever is ready to be released and allowing the process of expression until the negative damned energy is out, making room for the positive energy, genuine light to flood in. So can you see the tree? Even though Marion didn't work with the tree, you can, once you looked at the tree and meditated on it, you can see that that light and re-entering is necessary for the, re, for the masculine and the feminine, the yin and the yang, the force and the form to meet in the sacred marriage. So the, it's not feminine in the gender sense that she's talking about. And the bottom of the tree is the ego. Um, and it's the ego that surrenders and opens to allow the light to come through from the top. And so here's a beautiful image by Jofra Boschart um, about that. But I'd like to, um, again, a few other things here. The, the Gnostic tradition, the term Sophia, is wisdom in Greek is the final and lowest emanation of God. In most, if not all versions of the Gnostic myth, Sophia brings about an instability in the Pleroma. The Pleroma is like beyond the archetypal world. It's in the top and in turn brings about the creation of materiality. So our whole purpose is to uh, bring consciousness, the consciousness uh, return. So um, I guess I can't move forward. Can I? Um, sorry about that. I just wanted to pop back in um, to see if uh, I seem to. Oh. It's gone? Oh, my. Uh, now I see we see your desktop. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure what happened here. Uh, I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, Whoops. Is it, is it Keynote you're using? It's right to the right. I am using Keynote. It's to the right. That's it. There you go. I'm sorry about that. Oh, dear. I keep, uh, I'm going to go back to the, uh, uh, talk about experiments. Sometimes they don't work well. So we did this. So I'm just going to flow, flow through this way. So you can see some of these. Um, And um, I hadn't been meaning to stop the share. And so here you can see where the planets are laid out. You want to share your screen again? Because right now you're not sharing. Oh. All right. So you can see where the planets are laid out. Yeah, and then, for some reason, we're not seeing your screen. You're not seeing the screen? Nope. Uh, can you see me? I okay. see you. We see you. You look great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this. This is what happens in experiments. Um, all right. So I'm not sharing screen, you're saying. So go back to Zoom. Okay, so let's just pop in and see if we can find Dr. There you Jung. Go. That looks good. All right. Let's have a little of Dr. Jung towards our end here. Oh, yeah. This is Bollingen. It's Bollingen, yes. I was always looking for, for something in between, you know, something that linked that remote past with the present moment. Uh, and I found to my amazement, it is alchemy. It is the the the, the, the basis of our modern way of perceiving things, uh, and and therefore it is as if it were right under the threshold of consciousness. Uh, uh, this is a, a wonderful picture of how. Uh, the development of archetypes, that means the movement of, of archetypes uh, looks 
uh, when you look upon them as a form of all, maybe from today you look back into the past and you see how the present moment has evolved out, out of the past. And we can construct or even predict our, uh, the, the, the cultures of our days when we know what, what it has been yesterday. So I think that that's a good place to come out of the share um, because I think that's how this material can be helpful to us now. Because in looking back to the ancients and to their wisdom, and certainly the tree is is ancient. Um, we don't really know how far back it goes. It wasn't. Um, it Kabbalah means to receive, so it wasn't written down until about the 11th century, I believe. Um, but it is so relevant to us now to have, to helpful, to have a map that goes backwards, forwards, and really integrates um, body, psyche, and, and uh, the cosmological world, the archetypal worlds. So, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. So I guess Pamela asks, so how long does it take to complete the 18 hours? <laughs> she imagines herself wanting to sit with each sephirot. Would additional support come through working with you privately? Do you have any workshops planned? Uh, well, all wonderful questions. You, Because it's pre-recorded and one of our members is here. Hello, Jennifer, <laughs> who has been on all of them. <laughs> and... Um, I um, you can take your time because they're pre-recorded, so you can do them as you as you wish. Certainly, sessions with me are always available. Um, this is my work, um, and so I just keep learning and expanding. I mean, it's it's a never-ending journey. Um, so yes, that's available, and I do plan to continue um, my own work. Uh, we finished Sophia Sparks. We did Fool's Odyssey, Sophia Sparks, and then my plan is down the road after doing the Marion Woodman Robert Bly uh, Maiden King class. I'd like to do that. Um, I would like to move further into the alchemy, into working with alchemy and dreams, um, which is really my private practice work now. It's mostly uh, astrology, alchemy, and dreams. And and how can people find you? I mean. Uh, they can find me at uh, my website is uh, reclaimingsoul.com. And, um, and then you can also email me at uh, Eva Ryder at reclaimingsoul.com. And, and we have uh, a couple of different offerings. It's betterlisten.com is where we have our audios and videos. We recently released... Uh, Robert Johnson and Marion Woodman program. That's about 11 hours. And mo even subsequent to that, we released these four programs with James Hillman uh, on Senex and Puer and uh, art and therapy, just brilliant stuff. Another 30 or 40 hours of, of uh, incredible stuff. It's limited release in the past. So I'm uh, glad that we pulled this together and uh, you, you can reach out to us. You'll, you'll get an, another email. We have your emails. You signed up for the Zoom. We'll also post it in the Facebook group, other details on how to get the, on the Facebook page on uh, how to get uh, the info uh, and get access to these other recordings. So I think that's about it. Eva, any last word? Or? Yes, I'm answering a question right now. The universe or the world card is the one that sits between the moon and the earth. Uh, so um, I just, somebody asked that question. So um, yes, there's lots more because, and I just want to remind people as you're watching the, if you're, if you do purchase the whole thing, as you're watching, take it slowly, allow your intuition to work because it's an enormous amount of information. And I would recommend highly that you follow your dreams, that you do art, that you listen to play or play music, that you really, really incorporate it creatively. It'll help and let it work on you. And um, I'm still learning. And so thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I mean, I'm just grateful. And thank you, Steve, for everything that you're doing, because 
I mean, I was actually working with Marion from 2005 on to try to get some of her play stuff copyrighted and out in the world. And uh, we had one difficult time of it. So thank you. I mean, what you're doing is just invaluable work, keeping this work out there. I really appreciate uh, appreciate the verbal and the support from everyone and uh, good stuff. This this is great stuff. All Thank right. Thank you all. Take good care and uh, yeah, walk safely and yeah. Have a Thank great weekend. Have Thank all you. the best, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.